Last night in Soho started, I feel like a long time ago for me. Um, Edgar and I first met because Sam Mendes introduced us and um, we went on a night out in Soho and he told me about his idea and I told him that I used to work in a bar. I think at the time I still was working in a bar and had lived above a strip club in Soho. So I knew it very well. Um, and he asked me for a tour of the sort of illicit um, places that you find out in Soho that you only if you live there. Um, so we went on a night out. I took him to Trisha's and the Tukin and Troy and all these sort of like, you know, dingy clubs that aren't Soho House. And uh, and he told me the story and I loved it. I thought it was like an absolutely fantastic story and I couldn't wait to see it on screen. And then I think about maybe six months later, he phoned me up and said, do you want to write it with me? Um, and I said, yes, that's a very easy question to answer. Working with Edgar is just fantastic. He's such, he's such a, he's just such an amazing collaborator. He's so much fun to work with. He's so much fun in the room. He lets you be playful. He also lets you be dumb, which is so important to get a really good script is sometimes you have to say like really dumb ideas and uh, Edgar allowed me to be an idiot, <laughs> which was very kind of him. He told me the story um, and it, you know, just kind of like said it to me one evening when we were out. Uh, and it had sort of played in my mind a lot. I just thought it was such a fantastic idea. And then when it came to writing it, we rented an office in Soho actually, and we sat, and I think we spent two weeks with a whiteboard, just going through everything, like really analyzing the story, what extra parts might be needed to make it feel like a fully fleshed out film and talking loads about the characters. And at the end of those two weeks, we'd already got really the outline of the film. Um, and then, he started writing, I started writing, we sent screens, uh, we sent scripts back and forth, scenes back and forth, uh, and like slowly built the thing until it was, you know, the first draft of the script. And then we came back together again and we sat down in the room and we went through it and then we sent it to, you know, the fantastic producers, Naira Park, um, and got their feedback and, and just kept working, kept refining it. So it was, sometimes we we're in the room together, sometimes we we're in different continents. Sometimes I was on the set of 1917, um, sometimes he was in LA. Yeah, we, we, we made it work. Last Night in Soho is a psychological thriller and with that the key elements are always that it must be thrilling <laughs> as a get-go but also the psychology in it needs to pertain to the characters so you need to build characters that the audience relate to understand and then you need to create fears for those characters that feel real to the audience um so in this case you know with Thomas and Mackenzie's character Ellie the fear of losing your mind of not sure like if what's real and what's fake of, of finding yourself in a new city and trying to grow up and trying to fit in and at the same time finding yourself very different from everyone else. Those were the key elements that allow you to sort of build this into a psychological thriller. Last Night in Soho opens in the countryside with a young girl, Eloise, who is dreaming of moving to the big city and having a glittering career in fashion. Um, and basically it opens with her getting her acceptance to the London College of Fashion. Um, she moves to London. She finds herself in a hall of residence with a bunch of students that are not particularly nice. And she is not living the life that she wanted. So she moves out. She finds a bed set that's very kind of like a throwback from the 60s. There's still some of the decorations from the 60s in it even. She finds that it reminds her of home and also of where she wants to go. Um, she rents that. She Sits, settles in there pretty well and then um, I think the first night she's there she falls asleep and she's transported in her dreams through time back to the 1960s and in this dream she follows this girl called Sandy who is everything Eloise wants to be. When Edgar and I were working on the script, we always wanted Sandy to be iconic. And so we would look at a lot of kind of the art girls from the 60s, you know, Twiggy, all of these like famous actresses that really embodied that decade, that era. Um, and I suppose uh, the French call it je ne sais quoi, don't they? You're looking for something that's slightly uncapturable on the page and uncapturable on film. Uh, and then you have to cast someone who can embody that. And that's how you end up with Anya Taylor-Joy. <laughs> Very luckily, she is, she has the charm and the charisma to bring that to life in a way that I think Edgar and I could only have dreamed of. Anya's just such an incredible actress. Um, the first time I met her in person was at the table read for Last Night in Soho, um, which we did, you know, and it was the first time we'd have everyone together. 
And I know Edgar and her had done a lot of work um, on talking about the character and refining that character and understanding the sort of how she works, what her dream is, what she wants and what she's willing to trade for what she wants is, you know, all very important. Um, but I remember very distinctly after that first table read, you know, everyone left and Edgar and I were, we were sitting in the room and we both went, so we need to just give her more lines. She's fantastic. <laughs> she's just so phenomenal. And, um, you know, her singing voice, everything, everything about her as an actress, you know, what she brought to this role is just sort of immeasurable. Eloise is really who the audience should relate with, what relate to when they go into this film. Um, you know, she's young, she's just finished school, she grew up in the countryside, she grew up in, you know, Cornwall, Red Ruth. Um, she's very much a, a fish out of water. Um, and she has dreams and she has ambitions, but she's still finding out who she is, she's still finding who she is. And the one thing that's really important about Eloise is that she's obsessed with the 60s. She's nostalgic for a time that she never even lived in. Um, and that's, you know, through her fashion that's channeled because obviously fashion, the 60s, pretty good decade for it. Um, but she is very much, you know, desperate to live then and to be in London then. It was the centre of the universe. Everyone was there, the Rolling Stones, Princess Margaret, you know, you couldn't really get a cooler place. Um, and when she comes to London, you know, she gets into the, the London College of Fashion and she comes here ready to live her dreams and she finds that London isn't just what she thought it would be. It doesn't match up. And I think that's something loads of people, I certainly experienced it when I was a young girl and moved to London. Um, suddenly you find yourself plunged into this big thronging metropolis and it's, it's, it's frightening. And I think when Ellie gets to London, she withdraws. Ellie is very much a fish out of water. She comes to London, she's a bit lost. Um, she, she makes the kind of decisions that anyone would make in that scenario. I, I think crucially when we were trying to build Eloise, we were trying to build someone that felt real, who felt like the, the choices that you would make um, if you had found yourself in London. So, you know, she's not happy in the halls of residence, so she tries to find somewhere that she will feel comfortable. Um, she's not happy in the present, so she dreams of the past. Um, she's not doing well at college because she feels a bit lost, she feels a bit overwhelmed, and so, you know, she retreats, retreats, retreats. And then in that retreating, she finds this dream with Sandy. And Sandy's really the key to unlocking who Ellie wants to be, who, wants, who she wants to become. I know she changes her hair to look like Sandy, she dresses like Sandy, she even starts to talk like Sandy. And I think that's something that, I mean, not just young women, but that all young people go through when they're trying to find out who they are. They see someone they want to be and they try to fit into that mould. And that's very much what Ailey was doing. I think that's quite human. I mean, I definitely did it. <laughs> Ailey has nostalgia for a time that she never existed in and never visited. And I think we do have a habit, especially in Britain, but perhaps everywhere, of thinking of the past as this rosy garden. Um, where everything was fantastic and everything worked out. And that's so not the case. Um, and so I suppose, you know, Last Night in Soho is a love letter to London. And it's a love letter to 1960s London, but it is a love letter that says, hey, nostalgia is maybe not the best way to look back. Thomas and Mackenzie came in and just blew me away. She brings such a degree of vulnerability and youth um, and just sort of a, a desperation to be somewhere. I mean, she just embodied that nostalgia. And we should talk about her accent because for ages, I was like, I'm sure you're from New Zealand, but you do such a good like Cornwall. <laughs> um, no, she's really, she's an exceptionally talented um, young woman. And I mean, much like Anya, the two of them had to be such powerhouses to, to, to both embody these characters. Um, and they both went toe to toe at every stage. Thompson held her own. And I think, yeah, I think that vulnerability that Thomasin brings allows us as the audience to really care for Ellie, to really understand her. Um, yeah, I mean, she's, she's just great. Sandy, you know, moves to London and she wants to be a singer, an actress, a dancer. She wants to have it all. She wants to be on stage. She wants to be on film. She wants to be one of the it girls of the 60s. I think if Sandy had her way, we would still know about who Sandy was and we refer to her the way we refer to Twiggy or Lulu or any of these people. Um, unfortunately, what happens to Sandy is that, you know, the world doesn't always give you what you dream of and what you want. Um, it's hard enough having those dreams at the best of times and it's not just talent. 
you know, you can be the most talented singer, the best actress, the most fantastic dancer, but if you don't get that lucky break or you don't meet the right people, um, you don't get it. You don't get your dream. I think with Sandy, you know, she's the right girl in the right place at the wrong time. Ellie wants to move to London. She wants to live this life that she's read about, that she's heard about, that her grands maybe spoke about. She wants to live this like swinging 60s, you know, the complete kind of upheaval, the sexual revolution, the mini skirt, the birth control, like just kind of like, you know, the whole world exploded in the 60s and London was the epicenter of it. And she wants to experience that. Um, and she can't because you can't travel through time. And she wants to come to London, have a career in fashion, be a big time fashion designer, have everyone know her name. So in a way, you know, Ellie and Sandy both have very similar dreams. They both want to come to London, make it big in their chosen field and have immortality. In Last Night in Soho, Jack is, you know, lad about town, sharply dressed, Don Draper, 1960s London, um, well connected, knows everyone, um, has probably dated most of the women and um, yeah, can kind of achieve anything and anything. He's like a proper wheeler dealer. Um, and then obviously, you know, there may be other things about him that we learn as we go along. I, I wouldn't say any spoilers, but yes, I think what Matt Sprith brought to that character, again, is just a sense of reality. He breathes just life into these characters. He's so able to have that coolness. Jack understands the pitfalls um, and I suppose the the dangers of the time and realises that if you accept those dangers and navigate them, you can still get what you want. Um, and I mean, ultimately, Jack is the kind of person that wants to be with beautiful women, that wants to be seen, you know, with the gorgeous girl in his arm, that wants to be the bouncers of every club know him, the bartenders always know him, his drink's always ready, it's served before he orders it. He wants to be, you know, the life and soul of the party. Um, and I suppose in the end, he'll do whatever he has to, to make that possible. When Edgar told me they were sending the script to Dean Danarig, I like fully fangirl lost it. Um, I used to watch a lot of, um, you know, the Avengers like Peel and Steve. I was like fully obsessed with that. I was like, I think, I think for a lot of my, um, school Halloweens, I went as Emma Peel, <laughs> even though I'm like, you know, that had been like off the air for like 20 years, but I grew up in Scotland, like BBC Two used to just show it every night. Um, so yeah, I, I was like such a fan of them, um, of Dana Rigg and to, to know that she was going to be reading my writing was just absolutely thrilling. And then to see her in person, you know, to have script conversations with her, to see her act, it was really, it was so phenomenal. I mean, both of them are just such stellar actors they're just so incredible and and hold stage hold the camera hold the gaze of everyone in the room um it's almost supernatural they just know what they're doing and they know how to turn it on like that um sometimes diana would just go into this monologue and you would just be wrapped just utterly just paralyzed um with the power of it yeah we were we were so incredibly fortunate to have them